Hi, I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in San Juan Capistrano, California at the home of Mark Morton. He is a car collector, an aficionado, a well-known car guy throughout the country, and he has been gracious enough to invite us into his home. So, Mark, thank you for having us in here. You're welcome. I referred earlier to Mark that this is our, our Alistair Cook opening here with all the books that we're <laughs> sitting in your library. Um, how did this all come about, your, your love of cars? I don't know if I got it genetically or how I did get it. My dad was a garage owner and so I had proximity to cars my whole life and just it, from early on I was crazy about them. It was toy cars and always aspiring to be old enough to drive. Paid a lot of attention to them and in those formative years I was pretty much preoccupied with it. I remember thinking that the cool guys probably had hot rods and things and so that made me look in that direction. Mm -hmm. So was it a 32 Ford that first took your heart away or? Well, I, my very first car, because it had to be kind of like a hot rod, was a 38 Ford pickup. It was the pig snout, probably the least uh -huh. popular. That's coming uh, around now, though. Yeah, they, yeah, if you get them low enough, they look pretty good. And my dad fixed it up real nice for me. I, he had me help him rebuild the flathead engine, and he somehow found Eddie Martinez for the upholstery. I couldn't have found him on my own. And it was a nicely turned out truck, but it only lasted a few months until I wanted a 56 Chevy real badly, so they let me trade into that. Uh, we're we're going to be visiting Mark's garage here real quick, but I noticed your collection out there. You have everything from, uh, looks like you pulled it out from under a, a hay bale yesterday and it had been there for for decades to some pretty uh, high shine stuff. Uh, you like the whole gamut? The whole gamut, both all, all areas of motorsport from sports cars to rat rods. And I, I respect patina as much as I respect fine restorations. Well, can we go out in your garage and take a look at some of your stuff? Yep. All right. Mark, this uh, 26 Ford, pretty rustic here. How did this come about? Well, a friend of mine had exhumed some cars from a collection up in Merced, California. And one of the least of them was this car, and it was $2,000, but it was a complete Model T touring car without the fenders. And I just had kind of thought that I might get around to a project like this one day uh, in the spirit of the old Jughead and Archie. Mm -hmm. comics. Perfect. And coincidentally, uh, there were a couple of real good tea tubs in Hop Up in the early days. One belonged to a guy named Robert Williams and another more famous to a fellow named Red Hines in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Speaking of Hop Up, Mark is the publisher and editor of Hop Up magazine, so uh, pretty nice thing that you're doing bringing that back to life. We're enjoying it very much. We've got a small but pure market. Uh -huh. How did that come about? You just got inspired? Or? Uh, we just, it just an evolution of uh, collaborating with some people who thought found that the title could be uh, renewed and it just was the right time to kind of revive some tr traditional hot rod themes in, in publishing. And, and our grandfathers didn't call these things hot rods, they called them hop-ups. So most of you know that, but those that you don't, that's where that came from. That's right. This is a perfect kind of uh, car for hop-up magazine. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty exemplary of, of what we're doing, although it's a little, a little primitive mm -hmm. because we, we do get into some real nicely painted and turned out cars right. just with you know, 50s aesthetics. Yeah, which is nice because some of the, the magazines that try to look like, successfully look like the old magazines, but with the current cars, it, it's nice to let them know that they weren't all primered back then. You know, they were primered because you hadn't made enough money at the gas station to get that good paint job on it yet. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, Hop Up does a really good job of giving a, a broader spectrum, I think. Right, we're, we're not uh, uh, very ratty. These are all Chassis are very nicely turned out chassis yeah. and very functional and relatively safe. Mm -hmm. A 1932 five window coupe Ford, uh, pretty traditional here and, and well used. Quite. So uh, you, I mean it looks like you pulled this out from a barn somewhere or what, what's the history on this? We've traced the history back to 1961 where a, a young man named Doug Clark was on a family vacation going from Glendale to Lake Tahoe, and when they came through the Central Valley and I think Fresno or one of those communities, they saw this car in a gas station with a Studebaker V8 in it, a hot rod, for sale. Mm -hmm. And Doug prevailed on his parents to buy the car, and they did, and he and his buddy drove it up to Lake Tahoe, and they cruised it up there for two weeks while, while on vacation, and then blew it up uh. and had a trailer at home. He then uh, bought a wrecked 39 Ford two-door sedan, put the engine and trans in here, and then a small block Chevy and began to drag race it. Then everyone lost track of it, uh, and I was going to do a five-window coupe, and when Pete Eastwood was doing the chassis, 
he didn't like the body I had, so I said, well, find me another one, and they found this whole car. Uh -huh. Had the interior just in flat panels stacked in on the seat. Uh, it had a f the f this four-banger was sitting uh -huh. in the chassis. Someone was going to restore it into a stock four-banger car. Uh -huh. And uh, it had so much character in the patina that we allude to that uh, we decided, well, we'll just build this chassis, finish this car. We took the liberty of chopping the top and uh, drive it as a survivor. We saved as much of, the, of its character as we could. Uh, where the Kennedy brothers cut the top, they fogged in enough primer and enough material there to, to give it enough foe that it blends with the rest. We had to do a hood. Uh, I had that louvered hood, Eric Vaughn had louvered it for me some time ago, and we just gave it some of the panache of the early hot rods. Uh, so half the people look at it, say don't change it, and the other half say when are you going to finish it? We don't listen to those folks. Oh good, good. just wasn't anybody. <laughs> well you have something over here in the corner with a pretty, uh, a, a bit of a shinier paint job on it. Can we take a look at that? Sure. All right. Big sign on the wall says Rodzi, 29 High Boy, so I think we're looking at Rodzi here. Huh? This is it. Tell us about Rodzi. Well, this is a car I decided to build when I had a 32 two-door sedan. I thought I wanted another hot rod, didn't quite know what to build, and I kept looking at a little tether racer model that I had, and it was a 29 on deuce rails, and I finally revealed to myself that that would be the next choice, and we'd build a 29. This is the result of that. Uh, Probably our favorite car and the last to go, uh, one of those. Uh -huh. um, it was a consortium of talent uh, with John Carambia, Pete Eastwood, uh, Tim Beard, and Steve Davis, a wonderful metal crafter. The running gear on this? It's a ZZ1 350 aluminum head engine with a hydraulic, roller hydraulic uh, camshaft, uh, angle plugs, three twos. So this gets you from point A to point B very quickly. This thing scoots. Yeah. 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 Doug Nash five-speed, nine-inch forward rear end with 325 gear in it. Mm -hmm. Can we take a look at the motor? Sure. So a Chev power plant, three twos. There's nothing more traditional than three two-barrel carburetors. Mm -hmm. This is just, it was obvious to you that this is what you needed to do? Well, that's one of those circumstances where I thought a big four-barrel would be okay, and Eastwood said, why not three twos? Uh -huh. when, when when East would suggest something like that, I roll over and do yeah, it. Yeah, you listen. So the progressive linkage works fine and, mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. All right. right. And uh, the, the mood these days seems to be swinging a little bit more to a Ford and a Ford and, and you know, a Chevy and a Chevy. And of course, we have, you know, the, the huge majority still has a Chevrolet motor and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on that? No, just my preference is for Chevys. Uh -huh. I've got uh, some friends who would go forward in forward, but no. Uh -huh. When Henry built this, it didn't look this good. You definitely improved upon it. We all tend to over restore Ford cars, uh -huh. but this one isn't really a restoration. So you said this one is a kick to drive. Tell us about that. It is. Well, it's a kick to drive because of the T, and, and we have, there's an exclusive club these days of people who know how to drive a T. Some people think they do but can't. And so those of us who've learned it, it's an easy lesson to learn, uh, enjoy the fact that we can and you can't. Uh -huh. It's a 23T uh -huh. that has all of the uh, traits that a kid would have employed on his hot rod in about 1930. Uh -huh. So it has a Rajo overhead valve cylinder head for performance. It has a Wheeler cutout muffler where you hit a pedal on the floor and it opens up the exhaust uh -huh. system. Um, it's underslung, it's lowered all the way around, it has 20 inch buffalo wire wheels, has Rocky Mountain brakes, has spotlights, a chop top, fuel pressure pump, and all of those things. And so, and lowered spare in what we call a jaunty position, <sighs> and uh, so it's, it's more than meets the Model T eye. So how is the performance on it? Performance is good, uh, it, but it's still a Model T. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a 50 mile an hour cruiser. and. Uh, and just a ball to drive though. Uh -huh. Can you get to 50 fairly quickly com in comparison to what it is? So. Probably 25 seconds. Okay. okay. And when you show up to, or do you take this to traditional shows at all? Well, we take it to the antique drags or we've taken it, we actually took it up, up the coast to San Luis Obispo for a roadster meet one time. We didn't drive it the whole way, we trailered it most of the way. Mm. But uh, yeah, we take it out and just use it whenever we can. It's kind of a townie. We drive it down here to the beach 
when we feel like it. Uh, I understand we have a, a sexy cover girl here. Tell yeah. us about this car. Uh, this car was constructed by one of our icons in Southern California, his name is Joe McClelland. And Joe built this car in the late 60s. Uh, the, the chassis of this car made it an infamous trip with Joe to Mexico and back with a, with a two-door sedan body on it. S shortly after he got back from Mexico, he took the sedan body off, got this sport coupe body, and put this car together. So it has provenance in a couple of different ways. Uh, he built the car in about 68, and it, it found itself on the cover of Rod and Custom magazine in May of 70. Joe was a guy who started Ford Parts Obsolete in, I think, 1954. So he's just been the common thread through all of our Ford exploits, hot rods, and restorations in Southern California for all that time. So we owe him a lot. We do. And, and he chose me to buy this car as he was thinning the herd, and I, I take uh, great pride in that selection. I was at Bonneville a few years ago, and one of Joe's best friends said, Mark, Joe's going to sell the coupe. Are you interested? And I said, certainly. And he said, well, call him when you go home. Uh -huh. So the running gear on this? Now it has a, a 34 uh, rear end, 39 trans with Zephyr gears, and a flathead V8 with Denver heads and two pot intake. Uh, on the cover shoot, the only thing different was it had a Kreger four banger. And I think we'll probably one day, when we wear out this flathead, we'll probably put a Krager four banger in it so it's exactly the car it was on the cover of Rod. Did Joe Hustle. share how the performance was with the Krager? Um, you know what, there's a great, that article in Rod and Custom, May of 1970, tells the whole tale. He was pretty good. Um, I don't remember why he took that out, but only, it only lasted in there for about three years until he had a flathead, and that, that got worn out too, and this is another subsequent flathead V8. And he drag raced this car until a few years ago. Every year at the Antique Nationals, Joe would be out there with a green coupe flogging it. Uh-huh. You probably got tired of people saying, when are you going to put a V8 in it? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is this a Porsche or a Porsche? I say Porsche all the time, even though I know better. Okay. A 59, a little different than everything else you have here. Tell us about this. Well, I've always been a Porsche fan, and uh, I've had three 56s, including a Speedster, in 911 and 912 and like that in my past. And I, of course, wanted to have another, and the opportunity came, and I went shopping for a car. I was looking for a coupe, and this car was behind me as I was looking at the coupe that didn't turn out to be as much car as I hoped it was, but this was behind me. And I, I actually looked at it and looked over my shoulder and asked the fellow how much this car was. And I said, how much is the Speedster? And he said, it's not a Speedster, it's a convertible D. Well, it's got Speedster buckets and it's, Speedster has a four inch shorter windshield and does not have roll up windows. And of course, I, I think I knew that, but I couldn't see it over my shoulder. Anyway, it was a great car. Uh, it was restored from about a 59,000 mile original We've got photographs of the entire body stripped down with no dents in it, and uh, it's a nice car. So when you're going down in the road in this, and I know the, the emotions are similar to the other cars, mm -hmm. but the technology when you're driving, do you feel, is there, is there a real relationship between, uh, say, the, the, the Rodzi and driving this, or is it just, two, you still have the, the, the wind going by you, but it's two different things? I. I, I think that old cars are something to transport you in time. And they all transport me back. And while I'm being transported, I appreciate the virtues of the various cars. Now, the 356 car was a mountain climber, not a drag racer. Um, it'll run all day long at 75 or 80 miles an hour, and it'll get around a corner real fast. And it, but I just appreciate their virtues, and that's what I'm thinking about when I'm driving them. Of course, that one over there or any of the others, they just have certain virtues, and I transport myself to a time where that would have been what I had. Mm -hmm. When I had, a, I had a 650 Triumph motorcycle way back when, and when I drove that, a certain part of my personality came out. And then I had a buddy with a BMW bike, and I would borrow it every once in a while, and a different, little bit of a different personality would come out of me. Does that happen between the, the traditional American and an exotic German sports car? Well, I mean, I don't... Uh, wear a Sherlock Holmes hat and smoke a pipe when I get in one, but, but it, there's a little bit of Walter Mitty uh -huh. in all the different cars. You assume the character, if we were in the Riviera today, I'd be thinking about other styles of music than I'd be playing uh -huh. in this one if I were uh -huh. playing music, for example. Yeah, so I'm not the only one that different music in different cars. Sure. All right. Mm -hmm. One of the sexiest, sleekest cars to ever come out of Buick Rivieras, 65, 66. You had a 65 here. This, they are, 
it's such a combination of elegance and and customizing uh, and, and just they're, they're just gorgeous cars how did this come into your collection well it, I felt like doing a mild custom car and Rivieras have always been high on the list and we we always consider that 65 Rivieras are pretty much custom coming out of the right. box. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got the tail lights integrated into the bumper, it's got the cat's eye headlights and it doesn't take much so you get the paint off it, get it perfectly straight, lay some good paint on it, remove the door handles, lower it, you with wire wheels and yeah. this one was done. Yeah, do you have airbags on this? Yeah, ear springs. You were talking about the, uh, earlier we were talking about the different rings of the different types of people within the hobby, how, how we're all one big happy family, but there's, there's different. Um, where does this fall into to that, do you think? I'm bemused by the custom world because I feel like the custom community cares less what the world at large thinks about their hobby than the street rod community. I think the street rod community is, is uh, want to chest pound a little bit and show off more and the custom guys just want to be around the custom guys. Uh -huh. There are fewer of them I think and the devotees are really really into it. Mm -hmm. As I was growing up this is what appealed to me, custom cars. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really care how fast I got from point A to point B, just as long as it was respectable. But I was not, I'm a little bit pre-muscle car. That happened just right about the time I was in high school or after that. But I just wanted, you know, just this cushy, cool, ride and, and the muscle car thing has kind of bit me a little bit lately but you know I just wanted to cruise I just you know arm out and and like this and and you're right that crowd is is they're a little little more laid back I think low and slow mm-hmm mm-hmm back in high school I was in a car club in Tacoma Washington called Steeds Car Club and we had a car in there that actually had two different uh, owners at different times. Uh, Bob Mitchell owned it and then Phil Chapin owned it. 46 CAD, two-door sedan, cut springs, coils, it was on the ground, it was black. That was a, that was a bad car, it was very cool. So tell us about yours. We uh, were in the midst of a 32 two-door sedan project that just wouldn't get done. And we went to the Pebble Beach Concours and in the parking lot outside Sly McFly's, we'd driven in in a Model A two-door sedan with friends. This Cadillac sat there, and it was looking pretty good. It turns out that we knew the guy who had put it together, and it was for sale. I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it, and I had no business having two old cars at the time, but I wasn't even getting the first one done. So as the anniversary approached of our 10-year our anniversary, I bought the car and I gave it to Yvonne for our 10th year anniversary. Mm -hmm. That was 19 years ago, so it's in fact the car we've had the longest of all these. So I want your advice here. My wife and I's 30th anniversary is coming up. Mm -hmm. Do you think I can get away with going out and buying myself another car and, and pass it off to her as a It works here. All right. <laughs> Good, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> well, you have some uh, nice styling cues here that weren't uh, stock in 1946, the color combination and the interior. Tell us about that. Uh, the, the illusion of this car from 100 feet is what it looked like when we got it. But it, we had to go completely through the car. Every lick of this car has been changed in the meantime. Uh, we repainted it, subtly changed the colors. Uh, we had a Tom Sewell interior put in it that we think is very spectacular. Um, put an aftermarket accessory steering wheel on it. Uh, some railroad hubcaps weren't on it. The spotlights were not on it. I like these spotlights personally better than the large format Appletons because they're a little more subtle. That was an early 50s, probably a police car type spotlight, but they're working spotlights that we got in the box, new old stock. My friend John Carambia found them for me. And other than that, it's just a lowered car with a 68 CAD drivetrain in it that has always been the car that when something else wouldn't start, we just go get in the Cadillac and take it. Never let you down. Mm -hmm. Looks like a sprint car, and it looks like a sprint car that kind of matches the Cadillac. Yeah, that's the theme. So mm -hmm. how did this, how does a sprint car end up in your collection? Well, I, I kind of a student of the old Ascot era and wanted one of course and had friends on the lookout for the right car and a guy came up with a car that uh, he wanted to buy and take the HAL engine out of it for a project and he said he'd sell me the, the rest of the car. I thought we'd have to build a four banger Ford race engine for it and I was into it and willing to do it. And as soon as he got the engine out of it and I took possession of the chassis and the rest of the race car he decided he didn't 
want to use that HAL engine, and so I was able to acquire that and put it back together basically the way it was uh, originally. And then we just did a few cosmetic things. We changed the nose on it, um, lettered it up, and dolled up the trailer to make it look a little more nostalgic and old-timey. It didn't look quite like this when we got it. And the colors, of course, the car was already this color, which kind of matched the Cadillac, so we just made the, the whole theme and now hooked up. It's kind of a traveling road show. Do you ever fire it up and take it for a little run somewhere? I never have. Never have. I keep putting projects in front of it. We know that it'll run. It has great parts that Carl Schmidt was part of getting accumulated for it, uh, but I just had never gotten to that. Well, it's... Uh, it's garage art. Yeah, yeah <laughs> a big piece of garage art, yeah. A 1927 Stutz, uh, not a Ford, not a Chevy, uh, kind of a little bit different for, for the collection here. Yeah, uh, I love classics. And this is one that I'd had my eye on for a long time, and I actually, actually fell into the acquaintance of its owner in a hot rod curriculum. And it turned out that he owned this Stutz that I'd been admiring at this meet I go to every year. And I explained to him that I had to own it if he ever wanted to be done with it. And that day finally came. When you drive a late model, or say a, a late 20s Ford, that's stock, and you drive a late model Stutz at stock, is, is, is there a real apparent difference to you? I mean, can you tell you're driving something that was upscale back then? Yes, and it, that, that's a, a great analogy because this is a 27 Stutz, the same year they made the last Model T, like those cars over there. And this is a single overhead cam straight eight with dual ignition, 16 spark plugs, two distributors. It has nine main bearings in that straight eight engine, and it's a spectacular car. And it's the advancement and the craft put into these big cars is, is the reason that people cherish classics these days. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's so neat about the older, you know, upscale cars, the real pricey cars from back then, is they all seem to have, they really got into their radiator cap emblems, and, and this is an interesting one. What's, what's this about? Well, that mascot, I'm told, uh, is a product of the buzz in the 20s about the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. And people were pretty Egypt and, and tut crazy, so they went to an artist, I guess for, uh, probably Fred Moscovich, who was running Stutz about 1925, commissioned an artist to do this for a, for a mascot for the cars. And it stayed such through the end of Stutz. But the, the thing that bemuses me is that none of the historians have pointed out that if you block off these letters, the center words in the name Stutz are tut. Yeah. And I wonder if someone wasn't driven by that. Huh. Well, it's a, a good fit there. Mm -hmm. Pretty elegant, pretty nice. Thank you. Tell us about this one. Well, it's a 33 Lincoln KB 12-cylinder Judkins Coupe. And the KBs were just made for three years, two years actually in this configuration. And um, this was a 37,000 mile original when we got it. We put very few miles on it since then, but we're not afraid to drive it. Uh, it was originally owned by G. Henry Stetson who mm -hmm. was a scion of the Stetson family, took over the reins of the hat manufacturing company in 1906, I think. And the Judkins, that's a reference to? Custom coach work. Okay. It's an all aluminum body, um, probably catalog customs. Uh, Judkins would offer up a design and Lincoln would have it in their catalog that if you want a coupe, Judkins will do one for you. They'll take our KB chassis Judkins will ship in. They might buy the bodies 10 or 20 or more at a time. Uh, then there are the individual customs where nothing in the catalog suited the rich buyer and they said we want it really personalized and then they would do individual custom work in a place like LeBaron or one of those. So with, with Judkins, Judkins was it the chassis and the cowl and it went to them and they did the rest or was it more than that? Uh, well actually the entire body would come from Judkins uh, in the white unfinished, and the cowling, uh, the hood, the fenders, and the chassis would already be done by, by Lincoln. Okay. How's it stack up as far as drivability to the Stutz? It's more sophisticated than the Stutz. It's a six-year newer car. It has more synchro in the transmission, lots faster, and lots more powerful by virtue of its fork and blade 12-cylinder engine. Uh, it's way more car than the Stutz. Mm -hmm. The color of it, was that uh, one of the previous owners like this color or that was actually the way it was made back This then? is the original color. In fact, 
an awful lot of this paint is original paint. Mm. Mark, thank you very much. Entirely welcome. It's been Glad a great pleasure. You. A uh, very nice collection. Thank so you. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching the show this week. Hope you enjoyed it. And tune in next time when we'll have something just as much fun as this. So I'm going to go for a little ride. Thanks, Mark. See you, Lance. So I, uh, I pull out of your driveway, Seattle's to the right.